Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is a very real prospect of a new world order. The new world order does not mean surrendering our national sovereignty or forfeiting our interests. to defend the Constitution of the United States of America. By some, he's been called controversial. How can I convince you when your ears refuse to hear? You turn your heart away from me each time when I draw near. Your eyes refuse to Mine, they glance away in fear As if you should not look at your reflection in the mirror Now, now, keep in mind that some of my guests have been approached by Oh, Homeland Security or FBI saying Oh, uh, why are you going on the Clay Douglas show? My message to those guys that are listening this morning is Go get a cup of coffee, maybe you'll learn something We both took the same oath you know, to defend the Constitution against all enemies from foreign and domestic. I don't recall there being an expiration date on that. So well, it doesn't show. How can I contain this anguish and this pain? Knowing that your eyes are blinded by the light. He is the free American, Clay Douglas. I have no Free America, weekdays at 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern. Every time I think about the damage that's been done, the anger wells inside me till I'm almost overcome. I want to tear the moon out of the sky and drop the sun. Why do I feel so old? No, back I'm the only one. For the podcast and more details, visit www.freeamerican.com. Or catch the podcast by phone by calling 832-999-8621. You're so made of the darkness of so divine eternity. Like petty thieves who thunder in the shadows of the night. They break inside and enter through the windows of your mind. One more intro here. Every time our country stands in the path of danger, an instinct seems to have summoned the finest first. Those who truly understand when freedom shivers in the cold shadow of true peril, it's always the patriots who first hear the call. When loss of liberty is looming as it is now, the siren sounds first in the hearts of freedom's vanguard who come from their simple homes to find the fire and fight. That symbolizes the full measure of human dignity and liberty.
souls rising across the screen and it's day day and that means straight from the heart of Texas. It is time for Clayton Douglas and the Free American. Take it away, Clayton. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of the Free American. And my guest today is Keith Brothers. Hello, Keith. Are you with me? I sure am. You are uh, you're the founder and owner of the Constitution Club, one of the uh, sites that I uh, check out all the time for uh, good information. And uh, we're gonna. Uh, I've asked you. I've invited you to do the uh, fourth with me, but uh, I'm uh, also bringing up. We had some. Uh, Something, something is developing, developing news, and we're going to be bringing up Cindy Steele to join us on this uh, first hour here, because uh, her husband, Edgar Steele, is uh, an attorney, a pretty uh, high-level attorney. He called himself the attorney for the damned because of the cases he took on. Uh, he... Uh, defended Richard Butler against uh, the ADL, and then he uh, defended the Christie's, which was a uh, couple who kidnapped their children back from uh, the authorities, and uh, they came after him. They attempted to kill his wife. They planted a bomb in her car and uh, tried to blame it on him. So uh, we'll hear this. He uh, he has um, he's already gone to trial. He is uh, doing a time, but the uh, case is on appeal, and they're trying to get him out. So I want to hear from her uh, in uh, the beginning here, if you don't mind, sir. And I'd like for you to just kind of stay with me. So this uh, this would be a, a real education because this is what's happening. To Americans all over, I refer to myself and uh, uh, people like me and Edgar as being the canary in the coal mine. When, uh, because we're outspoken, because we're knowledgeable, because we understand what's going on with this whole new world order crap. That we're um, we're the uh, we're the targets right now. But the American people are now suffering and being attacked in the same way we were back when they were calling us anti-government, you know, anti-war protesters, tax rebels, whatever, you know, religious rebels, whatever, whatever name they could come up with. And uh, they've been pretty, uh, they've been pretty good about it over the last uh, 3,000 years. I mean, that's really what the Bible is, the story about the attempts to, uh, Establish tyranny over the American people. Would you, uh, uh, before we bring Cindy up, tell me about the Constitution Club and why you started that? I got started in this because of what happened at Waco, and I was pretty outraged about it. So I started the Free American Magazine, this radio show, and uh, the militias. And what, a, what better day on, on uh, the 4th of July to talk about our independence, to talk about our, our liberty. Tell me about you. What, the, what got you started with the Constitution Club? What is it? And well, I, well, by profession, I spent most of my adult life as a school teacher. And um, so I, I have somewhat of an educational perspective. And one of the things that, that I, I believe very strongly is, is that in order to be free, you need to be well educated. In fact, uh, Thomas Jefferson, one of his quotes essentially was that a man that expects to be ignorant and free expects what never was and never will be. And I believe that uh, freedom, uh, with freedom comes, uh, there's a the flip side of the coin, and the, the flip side of freedom is responsibility. And I think everybody in our country practically wants to be free, but very few people want to be responsible. They want to they want to have their freedom, but they want the government to take care of them at the same time. And that's an equation that frankly just doesn't work. So frankly, if we're going to be free and independent, we have to be responsible. And a lot of that is going to begin with a with a clear understanding of the principles of individual liberty and personal responsibility. 
And there were certain books and certain things that I felt were really, really important information for the people should have, because I don't believe that a person can, can really be uh, successful in defending his nation unless he understands the founding principles. And so some of the books that I really try to help people uh, study and get introduced to are The Law by Frederick Bastiat. I think this is absolutely one of the greatest treatises that has ever been written on the principles of law and, and justice. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think uh, the term a blueprint for a just society is, a, is, is kind of a, something that's attributed to Frederick Bastiat. The other book that I think is extremely important is uh, The 5,000 Year Leap by W. Cleon Skousen. He lists in the book 28 principles that the Founding Fathers incorporated into the foundation of this right. nation. Hold on just a second. Hello. Hello, Cindy. Yeah, this is Cindy. Hi, Cindy. This is Clay Douglas. How are you doing, dear? I uh, well, you know, um, I'm alive, and I'm and I'm standing strong, and I'm fighting back. I would expect nothing less from Edgar Steele's wife now. I, I've uh, we've got uh, Keith Broders. He's with the Constitution Club. He's uh, on us with this call, but uh, I, I, I wanted to bring uh, you up and uh, devote this uh, this time to you because Edgar has been a guest on my show many many times over the last ten years. Before that, even before they tried to kill me and uh, for many years before they tried to kill you I mean now uh, this is uh, this is not something that's just accidental uh, this isn't an incident uh, I, I've told uh, my audience that uh, Edgar referred to himself as the attorney for the damned he uh, defended Richard Butler he defended the Christie's and uh, who had uh, merely tried to retrieve their children that had been sold, stolen from them by Child Protective Services. And then, since the, uh, he, he came after I survived my, the, the attempt on my life, I restarted my radio show, and he came on it to uh, talk about his books and uh, to talk about his own going battle and both uh, your husband and I have been called anti-Semites and we've been attacked by Southern Poverty Law, by the ADL, by APAC, by all these Jewish organizations and we have very serious uh, reason to believe that these same organizations that I just named were involved with your attempted murder and and uh, when that failed when that plot failed they tried to frame your husband for putting a bomb in your car and we know who put the bomb in the car we we I know all that can you kind of bring us up to date on this? I mean, this is this is almost uh, uh, it's almost unbelievable what's happened. Now they found a bomb in your car. You were just luck that they found that, isn't it? Well, they didn't find the bomb under my car. Um, actually, the oil change uh, person that where I went to get my oil change is the reason the bomb was found. Um, you know, it was, um, you know, they didn't warn me about any, um, device and they have many excuses of why they didn't, um, warn me about it, but it took me getting my oil changed for me, for me to find the bomb on my car. Um, you know, <laughs> and, it, you know, if I wouldn't have had my oil changed that day, um, uh, a few hours later, I would have been on federal property with that on my car. Where were you? Where, where were you headed to? Now you you uh, you 
you and Edgar were living in um, Idaho, right? We were living in Idaho. Um, Ed was arrested on June 11th, 2010. And I, you know, I mean, they were telling me that he hired a, this hitman to have me killed and my mom killed. And so Ed was arrested and in, um, you know, already in custody. And then it was um, four or five days later on June 15th, I was went to have my oil changed while I was waiting for my husband's first arraignment hearing, and that's when I found the bomb. Okay, and now they what, what, were they, what, uh, what did they arrest him for? I mean, if, if the bomb had been found, what... Uh, what no, they didn't. They, uh, they, arrest, they arrested him because they claimed he had hired our handyman to kill me and my mom. That's why they arrested him. Hello? Yes, but they didn't, they, they oh. hadn't even found a bomb yet, so obviously uh, no. they, they knew that something was about to happen. Well, you know, once they arrested my husband, because um, I was in Oregon at the time, and I had two FBI agents show up at my mom's house, and, you know, I mean, they weren't arresting us, but I felt like we were under a house arrest because they wanted to make sure that I didn't mistakenly call my husband that morning because, and because the FBI was here at our Idaho residence telling him that I had died in a car crash and then after that, then they turned around and told him that my they found my mom at her residence shot. That was not true, but that's what they were telling him. And when they released me after they arrested Ed, they told me that I was safe and there and 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 they they then I mean they had um, well they. You know, they had Ed and their confidential source that had come forward to save my life. And then um, um, they released me to go. And, you know, um, I didn't really feel safe. I mean, my life was being turned upside down. And then, you know, four, four or five days later, I find a bomb on my car. And um, the confidential source, whose name is Larry Fairfax, um, ended up being arrested that day. And the FBI's first story to me was that they didn't warn me or tell me about a bomb because Larry Fairfax, who then, then admitted that he put the bomb on my car, um, didn't tell them about it. So, you know, he... He supposedly went to the FBI to tell him that my husband wanted me and my mom dead, but he left, according to the FBI, he left out the information that he had put a bomb on my car. This is, this is, this is, uh, this is just incredible that, uh, I mean, this shows well, this shows the direct involvement of uh, of, of the FBI in uh, an attempted murder. If they if if it was their informant, he was uh, snitching on uh, trying to set Ed up, and he also, while he was your handyman, didn't he steal about fifty thousand dollars worth of silver from you, and then uh, tell the uh, FBI that uh, Ed gave him that to kill you? Well. Um, <laughs> It was about forty-five thousand dollars at at the price of silver um, at that time, and what but what he told the FBI is that Ed had given him ten thousand dollars worth of silver. So some you know somewhere the other thirty-five thousand you know he's just been allowed to get away with, and you know the ten thousand. Ed didn't give it to him. He stole it. 
And, um, you know, and, the, here, and here's the other thing. Um, they claim that they had two recordings of Ed, which we had uh, two audio experts that um, proved that they were not authentic tapes. They were manufactured, edited, whatever you want to, terminology you want to use. And, you know, first, I mean, you know, I told you that first they said that um, it was because Fairfax didn't come clean. He was supposed to, you know, if somebody's turning, going to the police and turning somebody in because they're having second thoughts and regrets, they're supposed to come totally, fully clean with all information. Uh, but, you know, Fairfax went to him and, I mean, it was all a lie and bogus, but he claims he didn't tell him about the bomb. Well, I finally, on the June 15th is when I found the bomb, on um, June 21st is when I first got to hear the two recordings. I'm listening to the first recording, and the word bomb shows up on the recording. And so all of a sudden, I'm going, the FBI knew, the, I mean, at least they had an idea that a bomb might be involved because it's on the recording, which the FBI Michael, agent Michael Saka had told me he had carefully listened to the recording and was taking notes of anything that might be threatening. Then his excuse to me was, oh, well, I didn't hear it. I heard it on the first time I heard those recordings. In trial, it was testified that that recording before Ed's arrest was listened to by FBI agents and the prosecutor five times. You want to tell me that they didn't hear that word? I don't, I don't buy that. If they didn't hear that word, it makes it... It answers the question while, why Saka was scrambling about the security of the recordings the day after I found the bomb. So if, it, if he didn't hear it on the recording, that means that it wasn't on the, that that word wasn't originally on the recording. Can't have it both ways. Now... Where does this pressure? I now I, I I I don't. I'm not any fan of the FBI. I've been in this since what happened at Waco, so I'm no big fan of the BATF or the FBI. But uh, what? Uh, where did this? I I, I I don't believe the FBI just which set out to. Uh, in trap or to kill you, I, 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 I wouldn't take that step, but somebody did, and your husband and I, for just the conversations we've had, for the shows that we've done together, we've been, uh, we've been under attack for the last 20 years by the ADL and Southern Poverty Law. Now, your husband, uh, Edgar Steele, Oppose the ADL when they filed a lawsuit against uh, the uh, Richard Butler from the Aryan Nations. Uh, yeah, that was well. That was the SPL. That was actually the SPL. Yeah, Southern Poverty Law. Morris the uh, sleaze deed. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, I mean, there was that. He was very vocal on you know many subjects. You know, um, you know, because I don't have the investigative tools, and, and they're not cool. You know, um, you know, proving my husband innocent is more important to me. Um, but, um, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. You, you know, the, there's other aspects, too, because there was the fact that he was investigating um, the, what we call refer to as the Russian bribe scam, which is human, you know, trafficking, and yes. he was investigating that, thir you know, thoroughly. And we know that he was starting to 
um, find out some very disturbing connections between uh, Russia and the United States, and I do know that he had opened his mouth that this is what he was doing to somebody that he probably shouldn't. So there's that aspect of it. Um, you know, who, it, who the exact name of the person behind this, you know, I don't know. The main thing I know is that my husband is innocent and he has been set up big time. Do you, uh, do you, do you suspect or do you have any reason to believe that uh, Larry was working for the Southern Poverty Law or that he had been sent in by the Southern Poverty Law or the ADL or the Mossad? I think that uh, both, of the, both of those organizations are so, simply civilian arms for Israel's warfare by deception Mossad. And if, you're, well, if he was going in and starting to look at the uh, human trafficking, which, by the way, uh, I, I guess uh, prostitution is illegal in uh, Israel, and I've evidently so is uh, kidnapping women from the Ukraine and from Russia and uh, bringing them in there to uh, make horrors out of them, make prostitutes out of them. There's also, and, and I believe that uh, Edgar and I talked about, the whole uh, trafficking in human organs that's being oh, wait, done well, by Israel or Jews. Well, you know, there's a you know, there's a lot of that that is going on. Um, was Larry who was Larry Fairfax working with? Mm, you know, I don't know. I know he was in financial trouble. I know that he was sort of a sleazy, dirty guy that didn't, I mean, had, could have potentially been in trouble. We did, early on, we had an anonymous call that came in that claimed that, um, that Fairfax was working with the FBI and that the FBI knew about the bomb. Of course, the FBI or the prosecutor, when we presented that evidence, just laughed at me, brushed it off, and never bothered looking into it. Um, we also have had people that don't want to come forward that actually had talked to Fairfax, and Fairfax was bragging that the FBI had approached him to set that up. Now, you know, they're anonymous. We can't find them because they've gone into hiding. And, the, you know... The ADL and Southern Poverty Law use their agents to pretend to be the FBI many times. We've, we've, uh, we've had more many more than one report on, uh, on that. Well, and Fairfax is not the brightest person, and I mean that, you know, <laughs> he, you know, I could see him falling for that, and he was financially in trouble. I mean, he was in bankruptcy with about six, six hundred or seven hundred thousand dollars at the time. He was, you know, losing his logging equipment. He was losing his house. You know, he was in, you know, he was in financial trouble. He had a lot of, re you know, he had a lot of reasons to, you know, try to make a buck. And he wasn't, he wasn't beyond trying to make a buck illegally. What, what kind of repercussions happened to him? I mean, here's a guy that planted your uh, thing, turned in your husband and uh, tried to, uh, obviously, tried to frame him. And, and they, uh, the, the plan, I believe, just kind of fell through because you stopped in to get your oil changed. Otherwise, uh, well, he, he, you, you would have been dead now, your husband in jail, and nobody to fight for him. Well, you know, either, well, it depends, you know, it depends on what, you know, truly happened, if I wouldn't be dead, I might be, I might be sharing a jail cell with my husband because 
You know, they did try to point the finger at me that I put my, the bomb on my own car um, because I would have been on federal property with that. They would have, you know, said, oh, that's terrorism. Uh, you know, they could have pulled any kind of scenarios. I spoiled whatever scenario that was supposed to be when I got the oil changed. Um, as far as Fairfax, you know, he was supposed to, he was supposed to get off with nothing, even though, he, you know, he said he was involved and, and he had done these things, but because he had gone for, came forward and supposedly was really clean, but when I found the bomb, he was charged with basically firearm charges, and he, they gave him a slap on the wrist with a two-year sentence, and he, I mean, he got out last spring. He's free running, I mean, he's free running around my neighborhood. What kind of sentence did Edgar get? Fifty years. Fifty years. Yes. Now, what uh, what is happening now? What uh, I, I I just talked uh, with Wesley Hoyt uh, yesterday. He's your attorney, and uh, he's worked with me on some other cases. Uh, well, Wes, well, Wesley Hoyt originally started out as my attorney. Um, defending my um, victim rights, which were being violated every time I turned around. Um, uh, I have since released him from all obligations to me, and he is now, he's actually um, now Ed's um, trial attorney. And he's, you know, sort of, Working well, he's now working with an appellate attorney that we had to bring on because a, appeal is much different than trial. Um, we have an appellate attorney, a very um, famous, well known uh, appellate attorney by the name of Dennis Reardon out of San Francisco. And if we can get at a new trial, then um, Wesley Hoyt will be running. Uh, you know, running the new trial for Ed. Uh, and um, right now, we are on Monday, July 8th at 9 a.m. in Portland, Oregon. Ed is getting his um, appeal heard before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals for oral argument. What are the chances of It, it would appear what are, to what are it, yes what uh, what, what are what's your lawyers uh, what's your lawyers saying about this appeal I mean uh, it, it's kind of uh, kind of dependent isn't it on the uh, uh, on whether we can get uh, anyone can get a fair trial in America today if our justice system is being uh, stacked against well, us. Since the, you know um, since the first trial was a show trial, not fair in any way, shape, or form, you know, I don't know what the answer to that is because even though I believe that there's somebody someplace in our justice system that is, you know, has integrity and will rule fair, I don't know who those people are. I don't know if it's a panel of three judges um, I do know that the attorney believes that it's a good panel for, you know, for the case to be heard. But, you know, my confidence has been shattered in this, <laughs> with the justice system. And, frankly, right now I feel like my only, the only thing I can do is pray and hope that something breaks. That, I mean, we just released this DVD, which is um, called Witness to the Persecution, the plot to silence Edgar Steele, and we're trying to spread it far and wide in hopes that it puts pressure on them to do the right thing. Do you, because you that DVD clips, shows... If you have clips of that or anything, I'll be glad to put that up on my site. 
and uh, offer it to everybody. I've got a, a shop on uh, on my site. So whatever you want, all you got to do is contact me and uh, let me know how to do that. And uh, be glad to I, help. I will do that. Um, you know, um, you know, we're um, we're just asking for donations to send out. You know, the DVD because I'm still trying. You know, I'm still trying to cover attorney fees, and if we get him a new trial, um, it's gonna. You know, it's gonna cost me more. And um, but I can. There's a clip. There is a clip, sort of a preview clip that I can, you know, can send you. I'll contact you and we'll work with that. But they can also um, go on our website, which is free-edgar-steel.com. And, you know, if they send us a donation, um, I'll gladly send them, a, you know, a DVD. We've got the, uh, the site's link. Up on up on uh, freeamerican.com, and I'll be uh, I'll be happy to help any way I can. I, I have the utmost respect for Edgar, and I know from knowing him for the last 20 years or so that he loves you with all his heart. He would never have done anything to hurt you. Well, I know that, you know, um, I know that, and, you know, that, you know, in the beginning, that's what I had, you know, until I could get to the bottom of, you know, what the FBI and the prosecutors were doing, um, you know, when, when you're faced with that, and they're telling you that your husband wants you killed, it's, it's a... You know, it's a shock to the system, and, you know, in my heart, I knew my husband loved me. I didn't believe it was possible. I wanted, you know, and the thing was, I knew I needed to listen to those recordings. I, you know, I, I, I'll say I kept, a, you know, I kept an open mind, and I listened, but when I listened to those recordings, you know, it, it confirmed what I knew, and... And we had two audio experts. We had, um, because, you know, I knew that the prosecution, no matter what I said, uh, you know, they were going to discredit me. Um, and we got two audio experts, and both of them were denied to be heard in the trial. So, you know, the jury never heard any challenge on the recording. It, so the recordings were allowed to go in front of the jury and which, you know, they, because there was no challenge, there was no, you know, testimony to the contrary, they thought that they were true, accurate, authentic recordings. Well, we had two audio experts that said that they were not. I knew it. When I first heard it, there were so many things wrong with that recording, with those recordings. And, you know, and, and then the recordings kept changing. Every time I'd hear them the next time, there was something new on the recordings. So when I first heard it, it was only the word bomb. When I heard it um, several months later, again, all of a sudden the word car showed up in front of the word bomb. At trial, all of a sudden this tic-tac sound showed up on the recordings. Every time we turned around, something was new on those recordings. Edgar did radio shows, not only mine, he did radio shows across the country. So you've got hundreds of hours of recordings of his voice. Be very easy to uh, transpose those. Well, and there were, and you know, and there were parts on there that we also believe that somehow Fairfax was coming on long before this came down and was periodically taping Ed in, in conversations that they were having on their place. We do believe that that's where part of the um, recordings, have, you know, did come from. 
um, but they put them together in a fashion that made Ed, you know, look guilty. You know, I, I can't say that the recordings don't make Ed look guilty, but you need to know his voice. You need to know the way he speaks. And, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things about the recordings that are off. I mean, there's words being spoken, and all of a sudden, in the middle of a word, it's cut off, and it goes off in another sentence. There's places where, um, there's a place where um, they have Ed asking what time that is going to be, and the answer back is right. So the, even the, the train of conversation doesn't make sense. And, oh, and then there is this third recording that the day I went in to listen to the recordings, they told me that there was a third recording, but it was not ready yet. Hmm. To this day, they na now deny that it exists, and, I, and thus they have not produced this third recording, which we believe is the recording of the day that they arrested Ed because we have been able to piece together that there is missing, we, we have gotten the recording, well, we've gotten part of the recording, but there's 45 minutes missing. And, we, and it's because it's been transcribed, but there's a point where it stops, where the recording stops is where a friend of Ed's had shown up here that day and there was still another hour, and it's not there. What was said to Ed? What was going on? What, you know, what is it that they didn't want us to hear? Where is Ed now? Are, are you able to see him? Are they allowing visitation? Is anything Ab like that? Oh, absolutely not. Um, he is in Victorville. Um, U.S. Penitentiary, which is down in, um, Victor, well, it's Victorville, California, and um, for a long time after he went to the federal prison, they wouldn't allow us to have any contact except through mail. They finally relented and now allow us to talk by phone or communicate through this email system, but as far as my request, to visit. They continue to deny me visitation because they claim it would be a security and safety issue for their staff and guards. I have not seen him since November of 2011. That's got to be very hard on both of you. How long have you been married? <laughs> Well, let's see, it was 26, 28 years. How is he, it, how is he holding up? And, and, and how are you holding up? I mean, this is a tremendous pressure for you to be under. And, uh, you know, I, I've got a picture up on the website of your family. And I'm, uh, I'm assuming that your, your children are standing, uh, beside you and so that's got to be a well they are you know they you know they know as well as as i do that ed didn't do this couldn't do this wouldn't do this um you know ed's struggling with his health they they keep you know basically not tending to his medical needs they you know periodically deny him his medications and he has to fight them to be on his the medications that he needs for his heart and and that um so you know medically he's not doing that well mentally you know he has his good days and he has his bad days and his good days you know still aren't that great but you know we both have we both have had to you know, we can't fall apart. You know, that's what's keeping me going. I can't fall apart. I have a mission here. I have to fight for my husband. And if I fall apart, 
it's not going to do it's not going to do him any good, and it's not going to do me any good. I'm trying to keep my place together. I'm frankly trying to sell it because I need the money. Uh, of course, we're in a tough market, which is not healthy. Uh, you know, I've been working on the in the last year. You know, keeping going by putting the documentary that we just released together because the courts wouldn't hear the testimony and all the evidence that was there to show my husband's innocence, I have to get, you know, I have to get that out there. That's why it's called witness to the persecution because, you know, they're persecuting Ed, they're persecuting me, they're persecuting our family, they're persecuting anybody that is, you know, that is innocent. And, you know, I have my good days and I, ha- and I have my bad days. I cry a lot, but I pick myself up and, I, and I'm breathing and that's all I can do. Well, I appreciate the situation that you're in. And uh, I, I want you to know I've always uh, supported Ed. I've supported his work. Any way I can uh, help you, I certainly will. You're welcome to come back on the show at any time. And uh, we'll, uh, I, we've got everything linked. Uh, the website is www.freeedgar.com. Dash steel s t e e l e dot com, and uh, I've got a web uh, press release and all that. Now, what's uh, what's happening uh, here? What is it? Uh, I believe it's the eighth or something like that. Yes, that's the um, oral argument in front of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal, and that is where. A panel of three judges will hear arguments of why Ed did not get a fair trial um, and the issue with his trial. It is where we will hope that the Ninth Circuit Court will see that Ed didn't get a new trial, I mean, and, and grant him one. And then basically we start the whole process over again except this time I know with Wesley Hoyt we are going he is, is and will get a fair trial and the evidence will be presented the, and the testimony will be presented because everything that we have I mean we have Saka in perjury we have the audio experts that will have debunked the the audio tapes uh, um, we have chain of custody of the recording that was, was inaccurate. You know, there are so many things that are shady and illegal and wrong that if we can get that in front of a jury, Ed will be coming home. At least if we get in front of a reasonable jury. Uh, now, we certainly will pray for you. I'll ask everyone to do that. Uh, you can call me at any time. You've got all of my numbers, and all of my numbers are up on my website, freeamerican.com, along with this show. Now, all you got to do is copy uh, this show. And under uh, my name there on July 4th, you have the URL of the show. And you can send that to anybody that's on your email list. Well, I will do that. I will have our, um, we have a webmaster that has, from day one, has done our website, um, all volunteer. Um, and I know he will gladly get that pr- you know, put up. Now, what is uh, yeah. who, who who did the uh, filming for you? Who's uh, who's uh, putting that together for you? Um, it's a gentleman by the name of David Adams. Uh, he originally came out of uh, Texas, and he is the one that um, 
have done the filming, spent hours doing interviews, um, and frankly, you know, he's the one that has found, you know, the attorney that we miss, had the misfortune of hiring Ed for the first trial should have been finding all this evidence. He didn't, but of course, we have now found out that that attorney, McAllister, um, well, he was being investigated at the same time he was representing Ed by the same government that was after Ed. He was compromised, and he threw Ed under the bus. He didn't find this evidence. He didn't bother to present witnesses and testimony. He failed to get our audio experts in because he wouldn't even follow Ed's directive to subpoena the one audio expert, which is why he was denied being able to testify. This guy was compromised because, and in fact, this guy, after, after Ed was sentenced, five days later, a 29-count felony account indictment came down on this attorney, but we found out that that was all being investigated, why he was representing Ed, and that it and that it was put under seal so nobody would know about it. The government knew he was being investigated. He knew, but nobody said anything to us. They and they hid it until it was too late for us to get a new attorney, an attorney that would have been ethical and fought for my husband. All this will be presented before the Ninth Circuit, and uh, I'd like to get you back on next, um, let me see here, when we got here, um, sometime next week to give us an update on that, and by that, I... time, I, by that time I'll have everything uh, up, we've got all the links up now, that'll be right at the top of my site, for, uh, I will be glad to do that. Um, just know that the way the appeal court works, we probably will not have a decision. I mean, unless they see, I mean, unless they really see that it's such, um, a, you know, criminal uh, injustice. Um, mo they can take the oral argument and they can sit on it for as long as they want. Well, but, we'll see what, I, we, I what mean, kind I'll of pressure. I'll be glad to let you know. We'll see what kind of pressure we can do, we can put on them, and uh, make it it's just a matter of making it go viral, making people know what's happened here. And uh, I'll do my best to help every way I can. I've got uh, uh, days open from uh, July 15th on. So, uh, um, let I'm actually going to be. I'm actually going to be um, out of um, town because um, after the hearing, my um, my oldest daughter and her family are moving here to help me out, and I'm so I'm going to be helping them move, and I won't be back until the 17th. So, um, let's. How about if I give you a call and we set something up for after the 17th? That'll be fine, and if you just uh, give me a call any time and uh, let me know if there's been any uh, results, I'll make that public at, uh, at that time. Well, I definitely will. You know, when I get an answer, I'll get that news out to everybody, including you, Clay, and, and, I, and I certainly appreciate you giving me this time because this is, you know, this is what I can do is by getting, you know, getting the news out and exposing them for what they did. I appreciate the work you're doing, Cindy, and uh, God bless you, and uh, tell Edgar that I said hello and that he's always in my thoughts and always on my website. I will certainly do that. Uh, you know, it's really God bless us all because, you know, here's the bottom line. If they can do it to Ed, they can do it to any one of us. That's right. 
and more and more people are waking up we're actually having an effect and uh, it's a uh, it's due to the kind of work and the information that Ed has put out over the years so yeah well he was warning about this many years ago yes ma'am so, and it's just sad that he'd become you know part of you know, part of what he's, war you know, was warning about. Yeah, I, uh, I get that feeling a lot, uh, too. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, it's strange not to be a member of uh, law enforcement, not to be a member of uh, Congress or anything, and be fighting a monolithic conspiracy as we have been as an individual it makes it really, really tough, really stressful. So I understand what you're going through, and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, dear. All right. Thank you, Clay. God bless. God bless. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. We got a break here. We'll be right back with Keith Rogers. What do you think, Keith? Pretty uh, heavy story, huh? Well, it truly is. It's, uh, it's amazing how uh, the government that was created to protect the lives, liberty, and property of the people has become the uh, author of tyranny. All right. Stay with me. We uh, warm up that coffee. We'll be right back. <laughs> with a dictatorship. You could let 1% of the people have all the nation's wealth. You could help your rich friends get richer by cutting their taxes and bailing them out when they gamble and lose. You could ignore the needs of the poor for health care and education. Your media would appear free but would secretly be controlled by one person and his family. You could wiretap phones. You could torture foreign prisoners. You could have rigged elections. You could lie about why you go to war. You could fill your prisons with one particular racial group, and no one would complain. You could use the media to scare the people into supporting policies that are against their interests. Tune in Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, for Liberation Nation with Deacon John, where America comes to hear the truth. I know this is hard for you Americans to imagine, but please, please, try. But it's out of work, or scared of losing their jobs, dollar by the nickel's worth. Banks are going fast, shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Pumps are running wild in the streets, and nobody anywhere seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe, our food is unfit to eat. We know things are bad, worse than bad. I want you to get bad. I don't want you to protest, I don't want you to ride, I don't want you to write to your congressmen, but I wouldn't want to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and that crying in the streets. All I know is that first... I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Yo, yo. Be here Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time and near the news with Jason Brentwood. Because when it's time to crush, it's time for Jason. Revolution Radio, freedomclips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here.
This is Thomas, a.k.a. Mad Painter. I'd like you to join me Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Open Canvas. Don't forget to bring an open mind. Yes, that's, that's right. Bring an open mind to an open canvas. Again, that is Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern. You are opposed to your corruption. This is Revolution Radio. FreedomZones.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Now you can share the topics that drive the discussion.